Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Purdy. I'm the marketing manager here at Bond Shenick and King. I'd like to welcome you to this week's coronavirus webinar presentation. Just two quick housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter your questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to address those questions as time allows. Once the webinar has ended, if you would take a moment to complete the brief survey, we would appreciate that. We do share your comments and suggestions for topics that are of importance to you with our presenters and uh, appreciate your input. So to start us off today, I'm gonna to hand it over to Adam Masterleo. Kathy, thanks so much. And thank you to everyone who is with us again this afternoon. We have another great program uh, planned for you today. Before we get going, I have a couple of additional housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, we will be extending these weekly webinars through August 31st at, at uh, least. So please keep an eye on your email for updates. Um, I know that uh, for me, uh, there was a time when I wasn't registered to attend these webinars. I had to reach out to our marketing department. So just keep an eye. It was because I uh, missed an email that I should have seen. So uh, if you can, please keep an eye out for an email regarding extension of the, uh, the webinar. Um, also, a lot of the topics that we're going to talk about today and that we've been talking about in the past couple of weeks, uh, we have had corresponding blog posts uh, discussing. So, for example, last week, uh, Stephanie Fedorka talked to you all about the HERO Act, and Stephanie wrote a really nice detailed blog that went uh, through the HERO Act requirements. So uh, I'll try to point those things out when we do have a blog that corresponds uh, with one of these presentations, um, but this is just a plug for our blog, so uh, keep your eye on that as well. All right, with all that said, the first topic we're going to cover today is our update from Albany. Uh, last week, Katie got cut a little short uh, by time, so today we figured we'd put her first so that she can uh, talk for as long as she want, wants about what's going on in Albany. So Katie, please take it away. That's a really dangerous uh thing to give me, that that unfettered power to talk as long as I want. Uh, if I had it my way, it would be the whole 40 minutes. Um, but I don't have it my way. I, I know that. But don't worry, I do have a bunch of breaking news updates that have just happened in the past 10 minutes. So um, I'll report on those right now, too. Let's start with where we always start. Um, new reported cases. Uh, they continue to go down in New York State. That's great news. We, in New York, we have 40% of people fully vaccinated, 50% of people have one dose. Uh, so we are getting closer to having 50% of the state be fully vaccinated soon. Uh, great news. And speaking of vaccinations, let's go over some of the uh, news that's come out. La yesterday, the governor announced that SUNY and CUNY colleges will be requiring vaccines for the, the fall semester. Um, a lot of what my presentations are to you is generally walking back comments that are made by the governor um, to say what the actual standard is. So that's not broadly true. Um, SUNY and CUNY schools will be requiring vaccines for the colleges so long as they are fully approved by the FDA. Um, until they are fully approved, that requirement will not happen. Um, and that, you know, this is something else to be looking for, for K through 12 public schools as well. Um, if there is the full authorization of the vaccines, then we are going to be looking down the line of more authorizing or requiring the vaccine for attendance at school. And that bleeds nicely into the new announcement from the CDC that says that uh, Pfizer vaccine is now authorized for children between 12 and 15. Really, everybody 12 and up can take the Pfizer vaccine. Just reported that um, right now, the uh, commissioner of the Department of Health is meeting with uh, the CDC about trying to get this authorization you know, up and running in New York. Uh, as the earliest, it seems that uh, New Yorkers 12 and 15 can receive the Pfizer shot will be by Thursday. Um, so I expect we'll hear, hear a more formal announcement before next week, 
um, there's a good chance that 12 to 15 year olds will be able to receive the shot by this weekend. Um, so that is uh, uh, good news for a lot of 15 year olds who have been feeling left out. Um, one other update as well from the CDC, uh, and I, I wasn't able to include this in the slides because again, this is all happening so quickly that I didn't have time to update the slides. The CDC came out with a report saying that less than 10% of transmissions of COVID occurs outside. This number is misleading. Um, it's really closer to 1% of transmissions um, occur outside. The study that they were using was categorizing construction um, that was done both inside and outside in Singapore. Uh, and it used like, it was like a hundred cases uh, came from that out of the sample side. So it really skewed the results when the transmission was likely occurring indoors. I bring that up because um, I think we're going to be seeing the CDC walking back from saying that less than 10% when it's really closer to 1% and under occur outside. Uh, the equivalent is like saying that um, there are fewer than 20,000 shark attacks per year uh, when there's really 150 shark attacks per year. So keep your eyes out for that. I know we're going to have questions about uh, direct transmission, uh, especially outside, and we'll, we'll get to why I bring this up now. Um, lots of things are going on with reopening. Uh, I went over this last week, but I think that it's worthwhile to go over uh, what's happening again. <laughs> On May 19th, there are restrictions that are being lifted, but many will still remain, including um, the restriction that people have to maintain six feet of social distancing. That is very important uh, to, to keep in mind. Now, what else then is happening? What's, you know, the timeline? So let's start with gatherings. Outdoor gatherings at events, arts and entertainment venues go up to 500 on May 10th. On May 19th, the outdoor residential gathering limitation is completely gone. That's a change from what the governor said last week. And the indoor residential gathering limit goes to 50. Indoor gathering limits for uh, is at 250 for events, arts, and entertainment venues. And this is important that gatherings may be unlimited in size so long as all attendees are uh, either fully vaccinated or they present proof of a recent uh, negative COVID-19 test. Now, I'm hoping that next week I will have more information for you about what this means. Uh, hopefully the state will put out more uh, you know, pronounced guidance, more, uh, you know, elucidated guidance. But right now, this is what we know. Uh, and if you are going to be having a big gathering, worthwhile to reach out to an attorney, worthwhile to reach out to the local health department um, to, to discuss that. This is a big change as well. So last week, the governor went uh, and had an announcement with the owners of the Mets and the Yankees saying that uh, fully vaccinated attendees at these games may be seated at full capacity in assigned sections um, that are designated for fully vaccinated individuals uh, beginning May 19th, and that everyone else who is unvaccinated has to remain in a 33% uh, maximum capacity section, and social distancing has to be enforced between those attendees. Now, I'm not going to get into whether or not the state can do this, but what is a change is that the state's guidance on this applies this to more than just the, the Yankees and the Mets. It applies it to any out, outdoor event venue that's a large scale. So uh, collegiate stadium, um, concert venues even, could, this can, may apply to at some point as well. Um, so keep your eyes out for that if that is something that is of interest for you, but it does indicate where we may be going in the future. Um, by requiring, you know, by, by saying, look, fully vaccinated people can go to the game and enjoy it like you could have in 2019 um, is very different from you can go to the ball game, but you have to sit six feet apart from people and still wear your mask. Um, so we will continue to monitor that and do expect that that may apply to other places as well. Looking at what's happening with graduation and prom, the guidance was updated on April 27th, but it's not uh, fully 
updated with all of the reopening news that's occurring. If you have questions about graduation or prom, please reach out to an attorney to chat with them because I didn't think I would be involved in prom planning uh, when I went to law school, but here we are. Um, turning to other important caveats. So lots of questions about face masks and what can we do with face masks with fully vaccinated people? Do we still have to require them in the office uh, if everyone at the meeting is fully vaccinated? For right now, the answer is yes, uh, but um, yes, if everybody can't be six feet apart. If everyone inside can be six feet apart, it's been the rule all along, face masks aren't required. It doesn't matter on your vaccination status on that point. But, and this is my big caveat here, this Sunday, Dr. Fauci uh, said that when vaccinations increase and we see cases really start to decrease uh, even more, then the CDC will be looking to um, allowing vaccinated individuals to not wear masks indoors. Um, right now, the cases are still too high nationally to do this. There are above 40,000 cases. It's like 43,000 cases a day. Um, I expect that in a month, there's a good chance that this will be lifted. Part of the reasoning behind why they would lift this now is if a mask mandate needs to come back in the fall or winter, if we see a spike again, um, at least we've given people a respite from um, having to wear a mask all the time. Um, so for your offices, uh, you know, again, it's that six feet apart rule, you can have your masks off. Otherwise, if you're indoors, you can't. For outdoors, remember, CDC came out and said, um, you don't have to wear your mask outdoors. So long, if you're fully vaccinated, so long as you are not in a crowd or a crowded area. Um, most places except for, you know, uh, walking around in a field or golfing or something where you're not really next to people are considered crowds. So going to a restaurant would be considered a crowded area. You would still need to wear your mask around outside. Um, holding a meeting outside, maybe, but um, that's way more that's way uh, more preferable to holding a meeting indoors. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. It, it will these are things are still changing. You still need to do that contact tracing um, and you still need to require that health questionnaire, unfortunately. But I believe, oh, we got, yeah, just other, you know, these are our remaining questions um, that we have. And, um, you know, like we said, we expect that we're going to be seeing changes to these rules soon, uh, especially when you're seeing more and more people being vaccinated. So with that, Adam, I am all done. Katie, thank you very much. And um, I've been monitoring the questions as you've been talking. You have answered many of them. As you've I am. In your I, I like to think I'm omnipresent, but I know I'm not. But, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there was one thing I did want to provide a little context to. You mentioned early on about uh, Pfizer trying to get fully approved by the FDA. So the, the distinction here is that currently the vaccines that are approved, the Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson and Johnson are all approved using the emergency use authorization procedure. So none of those vaccines have full approval by the FDA. And that issue has caused a lot of problems for some employers thinking about mandating the vaccine. Uh, this is a big deal if Pfizer were to get full approval by the FDA. So that was something I wanted to point out. Um, one of the questions was whether we knew when full approval would be uh, coming and the answer is no, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, we're gonna- I might, yeah, I might, I might be able to guess questions but I can't guess that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and I, I saw one other question uh, about whether employers could ask for proof of vaccination. And the answer to that is most likely yes, based upon EEOC guidance from December. So I'll continue to try to hit some of these questions as we go forward. But we're going to move on to our next topic, which is uh, Pete Jones. He is going to be talking to us about collective bargaining issues uh, and COVID. So Pete, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Uh, it's good to be back here uh, on the Tuesday webinar. Um, I wanted to touch on a few um, issues related to collective bargaining and uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, the first is one that we've been getting an awful lot of questions on, and that's vaccination. 
Um, and uh, th this may overlap a little bit with what Adam's going to talk about later in the program. But I mean, obviously, when you're contemplating the bargaining question, um, your initial question is going to be whether you want to mandate it or encourage it. Uh, if you come down, um, you know, on the side of encouraging, um, I don't think the bargaining questions are going to be anywhere near as complicated. In fact, you may not have any bargaining obligation at all. Um, but if you are going to go forward, you know, you would want to think about uh, the things that we've been talking about on this webinar and in other places, you know, for the past several months. And that includes what is the impact of the emergency use authorization? Um, are you comfortable mandating um, when those vaccines are approved under the EUA? Uh, as Katie and Adam have been talking about, there's a, there's a, a likelihood that in the future here, we don't know when. Um, the emergency use authorizations will be, you know, upgraded to um, full-blown approvals, um, at, which, at, at which point that issue would be off the table. But for right now, the three vaccines that are approved um, are emergency use authorization approvals, and so you have to work your way through that issue. Um, you'll also need to have uh, accommodation uh, procedures in place. Um, we've talked about that previously, and you'll need to think about some of the other issues that go along with it. You know, the, what, what impact it could have on morale, uh, positive and negative, uh, what impact it could have on your ability to staff, um, and uh, what might happen if your employees engage in some sort of collective effort or concerted effort um, uh, to not work or to refuse to comply uh, with a mandate. So those are things you ought to think about ahead of time, um, which of course will get you also thinking about what the alternatives might be. Um, and lastly, and I think critically here, what are the consequences uh, if someone refuses to mandate? That's going to be a that's going to be a very important thing to have thought through. Um, but in any event, let's let's assume you've made this decision um, and you're going to move forward with a vaccination um, decision. Um, then you're going to be talking about what your collective bargaining obligation is with your union. And Kathy, if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, broad overview here, an employer has a duty to bargain over the terms and conditions of employment with a union that represents its employees. Um, so for those of you who have unions, you have a bargaining obligation with respect to terms and conditions of employment. Hang on just a second, because in a minute or two, I'm going to talk about what your obligations might be if your employees refuse to work in a non-union setting, um, it may also be regulated by the National Labor Relations Act. Um, there, is, there are two categories of bargaining. There are um, what is known as decision bargaining, that is bargaining over a decision to do something. Uh, example might be to implement a layoff or to make a change to health insurance. In this case, to implement a vaccination requirement. Um, and then there's also what's known as effects bargaining. That is the obligation to bargain over the effect of a decision. So even if an employer has the right to make a decision under the collective bargaining agreement, sometimes unions will come in and demand to bargain over the effects of that decision. So the first thing you'll want to do in assessing uh, what we're doing in a collective bargaining environment is whether you have contract language that allows you to proceed with a vaccination requirement. In essence, the question you'll be asking yourself is whether you've already bargained over this issue and you have the right to do it. Um, and some employers probably do under their existing collective bargaining agreements. I would be looking at your management rights clause. I would be looking at your health and safety clauses. I'd be looking at, at places where it says that the employer has the right to make rules and regulations regarding safety, uh, things of that nature. Um, there, are, there, there has been and continues to be a debate over how specific a clause needs to be in order to reserve to the employer the right to bargain um, or the right to implement rather in lieu of bargaining. In other words, that you've already bargained the subject and you have a sufficient reservation of contract right in your language. This is something that the NLRB has um, changed its review of at the standard of review over the past couple of years. So I would recommend if you're assessing language in your contract that you contact your labor lawyer 
and uh, ascertain whether you've got the requisite level of specificity to allow you to do this, to say that you've already got the contract right. Um, if you don't have that contract right, you've only got a very general management rights clause or perhaps even no management rights clause at all. Um, the next question will be, can you bargain about this subject midterm? Some clauses in contracts known as merger clauses preclude midterm bargaining on certain subjects. So you'll wanna make sure if you don't have the affirmative right that you also don't have um, a problem that you've committed not to bargain about anything that's not in the collective bargaining agreement for the term of the agreement. Assuming no contract right and no merger clause precluding midterm bargaining, then you should be able to bargain over the subject. And the outcomes here could be, at least in theory, that you reach an agreement with a union, which discusses the terms under which you implement a mandatory vaccination policy, that you get to a bargaining impasse, in which case you may have the right to implement, um, uh, it's a difficult standard to meet, but you may have the right to implement your vaccination policy, or that you reach some other form of a stalemate in bargaining and you decide that you don't wanna proceed because you don't have a clear agreement. So there's a lot of possibilities once you engage in this bargaining, assuming you don't have the right and assuming that midterm bargaining is not precluded by a merger clause. What are we talking about here if you um, don't have the right or if there is a, a legal fight over what the meaning of the contract is or the, the um, impact of the employer's conduct? The two main places where we're going to see a challenge would be arbitration, that is an arbitrator ruling on whether or not the employer had the contract right or followed the contract in affecting its actions, or potentially an NLRB charge, a charge with the National Labor Relations Board asserting that the employer either didn't bargain and it needed to, or somehow that a unilateral change was made um, that violates the National Labor Relations Act. So those are the two primary areas where we're likely to see disputes being litigated um, to the extent that we don't have agreement on how to proceed. Um, I did mention to you, um, in a non-union setting, you can still have protected concerted activity. And protected concerted activity is still protected under the National Labor Relations Act, uh, as its name implies, um, uh, even in a non-union setting. And, and this really refers to the right of employees to band together and engage in activities for what is known as mutual aid and protection. And I think the concept here that could be problematic for some employers is if a group of non-union employees who would otherwise be eligible to organize under the National Labor Relations Act does engage in some sort of group activity in opposition to a vaccination requirement or to anything else that the employer does that's COVID related, th there is the potential there that their actions could be protected under the National Labor Relations Act. So there's a little bit of a trap for the unwary here. You just need to be careful, make sure that if your employees are acting together, um, that you're not um, uh, taking action against them in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. So that's a broad summary of what we would do with respect to vaccination and some of the bargaining issues. Kathy, if we could go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about bargaining and workplace safety. Um, so um, what are the standards that you must follow? Broadly speaking, you've got the general duty clause under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. That is every employer's got an obligation to provide a safe workplace. workplace. Um, in addition, there may be specific standards that OSHA has promulgated that govern certain areas, um, certain industries, um, certain equipment, things of that nature. And so you certainly have an obligation to follow those. Um, and then there are certain state law requirements that are imposed um, that uh, may reflect on workplace safety. So um, once again, here, you're going to be asking yourself, what does your contract say? Have you already bargained about these safety issues? Um, and it may take the form of existing safety committees. Um, in many cases, these committees are not active, um, and, but, but you may have provisions that talk about them. Uh, there may be a labor management committee that's been established and um, within its authority is the discussion of safety issues. And if that's the case, you might have um, 
uh, discussion uh, with that committee of, of safety issues. Um, but there may also be issues that have not been addressed in the collective bargaining agreement, either through a broad management rights clause or through health and safety language or your existing committees. And in those contexts, you might get into bargaining or even discussions um, with the union about um, of what you might wanna do in the workplace safety area. A lot of times here, people can get a little bit hung up on the nomenclature. Are we bargaining? Are we just having a discussion? You know, what is this? Um, my thought here is that you may be able to get into a productive dialogue with your union. If someone's asking you about safety issues, it really doesn't matter whether you call it negotiations or you call it discussions or whatever, having a meeting and, and potentially reaching a productive solution can be helpful in this area. So uh, those are some quick thoughts on uh, your bargaining obligations and workplace safety. Some things may be imposed upon you, others may be uh, uh, fruit for you know, collective bargaining and hopefully productive discussion. Last thing I wanted to touch on today, Kathy, if you could go to the next slide, please, is you know, bargaining and leave. Um, and again, paid leave is generally speaking a mandatory subject to bargaining because it's a term or condition of employment. And most collective bargaining agreements, existing collective bargaining agreements have some form of paid leave. A lot of them have vacation, some have sick leave, many have personal leave, a lot of them have holidays, some lump it all together as a form of PTO, paid time off. Um, but I would assert to you that the lack of leave in some or all of these areas is actually a conscious choice that the parties to a collective bargaining agreement have made. Um, perhaps, you know, they preferred to have the, the economic resources concentrated in wages or health insurance. So just because they don't have leave or they don't have a lot of leave in any or all of these areas, doesn't mean that the parties haven't bargained over those issues. They have, they just haven't prioritized them. So with that um, as the backdrop, we've got the state and federal leave requirements. They're kind of an overlay here, things that um, one government or the other tells us we must do. Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, Families First Coronavirus um, you know, um, re Relief Act, those kinds of leaves that have been imposed by the feds. New York State, New York State paid sick leave, New York State COVID leave, New York State vaccination leave. So these are things that get added on to whatever it is the parties have negotiated. Um, the really tricky issue here, and it's beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about today, is you know what do you do when you've got this minimum standards legislation, some obligation that the government says all employers must follow um, in the context of collective bargaining? And most of the statutes that we've seen, certainly at the state level, show some deference for the bargaining process and indicate that that process would trump what's in the state law to the extent the parties have agreed otherwise. Um, so you, the other thing to, to note here is you may end up with challenges in various forums um, at the Department of Labor, at the NLRB, in arbitration under your contract, in the courts. Um, so a lot of challenges here in terms of bargaining and paid leave um, that I think have been sort of heightened and exacerbated uh, by the pandemic and frankly, by the legislation that the state and federal government has put in place to try and address the pandemic. I've probably gone on a little bit too long here, but I wanted to uh, touch on all these aspects of bargaining. Adam, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Pete, hey, thanks so much. Uh, there was one question that came through that I thought we might follow up on. Um, someone asked whether or not an employer has to bargain over whether they can ask their employees for proof of vaccination. Hmm. Um, so, it, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you, please. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, I, I think the answer to that is most likely no. Um, and I think the answer to that is, uh, that is driven by the fact that my guess is that the parties have a longstanding practice in place that um, you know, certain documentation is routinely sought and received by the employer um, relative to health and safety in the workplace, fitness for the employee to work, um, and things of that nature. Um, the counter argument, of course, would be 
uh, you know, from the union side or the employee side that, you know, you haven't ever asked about this previously. We don't have a specific clause in our contract that speaks to it. Therefore, you don't have the right to do it. It's a mandatory subject. I would look to both our history and practice. Um, I would also look to your management rights clause, your health and safety clause, um, uh, to ver your fitness for duty clause, um, things like that to, um, uh, to demonstrate that, you know, it's a, there, there's a practice and a course of dealing and contract language that allows the employer to do it. Well, thank you, Pete. That was very helpful. Um, okay, we're going to move on now to uh, DJ Nugent. He's an attorney in our employee benefits practice group. Um, he's going to talk to you about uh, legal issues associated with vaccination incentive programs. I know that a lot of employers are thinking about these or are offering them. So DJ, please take it away. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so just kind of piggybacking off what, what Pete talked about, a lot of employers are thinking about incentivizing employees to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And I'm going to talk about the employee benefits issues that are implicated when employers um, are exploring doing that. So just to set the stage, with the legal framework, employer incentivized COVID-19 vaccination programs will likely be considered wellness programs. And wellness programs are subject to various laws, but for today, I'm just gonna speak about three of them. The Americans with Disabilities Act, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. There's obviously other issues that can come up, but, but for today, I think these three are gonna be the focus of our discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So the first requirement I'm gonna talk about is under the ADA and GINA. The ADA and GINA are worried with wellness programs that an incentive is going to be so high that it's no longer really a voluntary incentive, that employees are essentially forced to participate in the wellness program. In this instance, it would be they're forced to get the, the vaccine. So both the ADA and GINA limit the amount that can be provided to employees as an incentive to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. What that incentive limit is under the ADA and GINA is currently in a state of flux. There's some long and storied history on those regulations and rules, but most currently a proposed regulation was issued in January of this year during the previous presidential administration by the EEOC. That regulation has subsequently by the new administration been pulled back, but a lot of people, us included, think that whatever regulation is finally issued by the EEOC is going to resemble what was issued in January of this year. So that's what we're going on for the time. being. What that proposed regulation says is that employers cannot offer an incentive that's more than a de minimis incentive. What the EEOC used as examples of a de minimis incentive was a water bottle or a gift card of modest value. So obviously the EEOC under these proposed regs is saying you can really not offer large incentives to your employer employees to participate in a wellness program such as getting COVID-19 vaccine. Obviously a tough hurdle to get across. Importantly, we think you can structure these vaccine incentive programs so that they're exempt from the ADA and GINA limit. And the way that we would structure these programs is, and this is based on some EEOC guidance that was issued in the mandatory vaccine sphere, but we were reading into the mandatory vaccine sphere, the, the vaccine incentive rules as well. And what that EEOC guidance said is that the ADA and GINA incentive limits won't apply if the vaccine is administered by a third party provider that's not contracted by the employer. So the employer does not have somebody come to their workplace to offer the vaccine and then the employer incentivizes employees to get it or they, the employer doesn't do it themselves and incentivize the employees to get the vaccine. This scenario is employees go to their local pharmacy or, the, or their local COVID um, vaccine center, they get vaccinated, they get their card, they bring it back to the employer, employer says, yes, you were vaccinated, here's your incentive, here's $100, for instance still need to be careful um, that the employer isn't asking any medical questions, getting any medical history from the employee. It, it's really got to be a simple, were you vaccinated? Yes or no? Here's your incentive. 
Um, so that's a, a way to structure it so that you can avoid these pretty strict ADA and GINA incentive limits on the vaccine incentive programs. Next slide, please. Even if you can structure your program so that you're exempt from the ADA and GINA's incentive limits, there's gonna be some other ADA requirements you would need to comply with for these vaccine incentive programs. So employers need to make sure that the COVID-19 vaccine incentive program is available to all employees. And they're also gonna to need to provide reasonable accommodations to employees with disabilities. And this is gonna require the employers to undertake a reasonable accommodation analysis to allow an individual to receive the incentive by some other means if they're unable to be vaccinated due to a disability or a religious condition. Employers are also going to need to comply with ADA provisions that prohibit discrimination in the terms, conditions, and privileges of employment, and they're going to have to maintain the confidentiality of medical information provided by the employees. So again, even if employers can structure their incentive program so that they're exempt from the ADA and GINA's incentive limits, they're still gonna have some other requirements to pass through for the, for the ADA. Uh, next slide, please. Other than the ADA and GINA, HIPAA can also apply. So HIPAA's non-discrimination requirements apply to wellness programs. There's various non-discrimination requirements that HIPAA imposes on these types of programs. HIPAA itself has an incentive limitation. And what HIPAA's incentive limitation says is that these welfare program incentives not exceed 30% of the total cost of employee-only coverage under the employer's health insurance. What, when I say employee-only coverage, that means single coverage under the plan. Importantly, that is taking into account employee and employer contributions. So it's a relatively large number that HIPAA allows as an incentive. The vaccine incentive programs under HIPAA also have to provide for a reasonable alternative standard. This is similar to the ADA's reasonable accommodation requirement. And what HIPAA requires is that a reasonable alternative standard or waiver of that standard is provided to employees for whom it's unreasonably difficult due to a medical condition to get the vaccine or for whom it's medically inadvisable to get the vaccine. The takeaway here is under both HIPAA and the ADA, there's likely going to be a scenario where if an employer offers a vaccine incentive program, you may have employees who re are required to receive the incentive, even though they're not getting the vaccine. And that's just something we need to think through how that's going to work, what they could do instead of getting the vaccine to still get the incentive. But like HIPAA says, it, it could just be a waiver of that standard in and of itself. Uh, next slide, please. HIPAA also has some other non-discrimination requirements in addition to the incentive and the reasonable alternative standard. And this is just in the design of the program. So there, the program needs to be designed to discuss the frequency of the reward. The program needs to have a reasonable design component, uniform availability, and notice of availability. So again, even if a program is structured so that it's exempt from the ADA and GINA's incentive limits, likely still going to be subject to HIPAA's incentive limits and also going to have to jump through some hoops under both the ADA and HIPAA, reasonable accommodation, reasonable alternative standard, and some design requirements as well. Uh, next slide, please. So th the takeaways are when you have these employer incentivized vaccine programs, there are employee benefits laws that need to be we can likely structure these programs so that they're exempt from some of the, the more restrictive incentive limits, um, but still likely subject to the HIPAA incentive limits. There's a possible way to structure these so they are exempt from GINA, HIPAA, and the ADA, and that's through combining the vaccine incentive as part of your employee assistance plan or EAP. Um, that's something to think about if see if that's possible as well. It might be able to remove some of these requirements that we talked about today. But even if you can't do it that way, the HIPAA incentive limitations are not as restrictive as the ADA and GINA incentive limitations, but you still do have some, some requirements to meet there as well. Everything we've talked about today is not coming from any firm guidance that's been issued on COVID-19 vaccine incentive plans. It's just how wellness programs are typically run, and we think that these vaccine incentive programs fall into that category of wellness programs. 
earlier this year, large national employer groups, chambers of commerce, other trade associations penned a letter to the EEOC and said, we would really like some guidance on what we can do to incentivize our employers to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. It's a hot button issue. We, we want to know. It, there's some ambiguity and we want you to opine on it. The EEOC rather unhelpfully did respond to that letter and just said, we're working on it. We have not seen anything come out specifically on this topic yet, but we're hoping to see something relatively soon. So that EEOC guidance could modify what we talked about today, and they could issue very specific guidance just for COVID-19 vaccines, really not for wellness programs. We'll just have to see um, what they see. So that's all I have, Adam. Uh, thanks. DJ, thank you so much. That is a, a quite a complicated topic. And given that, we've had a number of questions in the chat about whether the presentation is going to be available to uh, everyone who's participating, and it will. It'll go out in an email to you uh, in the next couple of days, so keep an eye out for that. Last but not least today is going to be Mary Aldridge. She is going to be talking to us about a law that was just passed in the New York State Senate and Assembly, but has not yet been signed regarding healthcare staffing laws. And I mentioned early on in the webinar that we have uh, blog posts that sometimes correspond with uh, these topics. And Mary and another attorney in our Buffalo office wrote a nice blog post on this, on these two laws. So Mary, take it away. All right, thanks Adam. So I'm going to be discussing, um, it's actually a pair of proposed laws that have been making their way through the New York legislature recently. Both of them address safe, safe staffing measures in healthcare facilities across New York State. And the difference between these two bills is that one of them pertains specifically to hospitals, while the other um, relates to nursing homes. And just a quick status update, I did check immediately before this webinar as to whether um, these bills have been um, signed into law yet, and they have not as of as of this morning. So the bills have passed both the Senate and the Assembly, but have not been delivered to the governor um, or received a signature yet. So we will um, await that and of course provide an update as soon as, as soon as we can. So I'm gonna discuss these proposed laws at, at just kind of a high level, just to give a, a broad overview of what these, these, new, um, these new laws are gonna entail. So first let's talk about the hospital staffing bill. So really this does, this does two things. First, it's, this law is gonna require hospitals to create what's called um, a clinical staffing committee. And secondly, those, that committee is gonna be charged with creating an annual staffing plan for the hospital. Those are really the two components of this, this hospital specific bill. So let's drill down a little more on those two components. So first, under the law, every general hospital that's licensed pursuant to the public health law must establish and maintain a clinical staffing committee that's made up of registered nurses, licensed, licensed practical nurses, ancillary staff members providing direct patient care, and hospital administrators. And at least 50% of the committee has to be those actual um, caregivers, um, <clears throat> as opposed to the the administrators <clears throat> who can only make up the other half of it. In the alternative, hospitals also have the option of assigning the required functions of a clinical staffing committee to an existing committee, such as a committee that's already been established by um, a collective bargaining agreement. The deadline to form the committee or assign the statutory functions of an, to an existing committee is January 1st of <clears throat> of 2022. So step one is to form the committee and do that by the end of the year. Next, let's talk about what this committee actually has to do. So as a preliminary matter, the legislation requires that employee participation in committee activities take place during actual paid work time. So any employee that's on the committee has to be on the clock while they're performing committee functions. The committees are charged with developing and implementing annual clinical staffing plans that include specific staffing for each patient care unit and work shift and must be based on the needs of the patients. 
The staffing plans must include specific guidelines or ratios, matrices, or grids indicating how many patients are assigned to each registered nurse and the number of nurses and ancillary staff to be present on each unit and each shift. So to be clear, the law doesn't actually give us these figures, but rather the law re will require hospitals to form committees that are gonna come up with these figures. And that's <clears throat> a bit different than the nursing home bill, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. <clears throat> So when developing the staffing plans, the committees are required to take into account a number of factors that are laid out in the legislation, um, such as the hospital census, the staff's skill mix at the facility and the availability of personnel, just, just to name a few. In addition, an updated plan must be submitted to the Department of Health by July 1st every year, and the deadline for the hospital to implement the plan is the following January 1st. So this is going to be an annual thing going forward. An interesting part of this legislation is that it requires hospitals to post in a publicly conspicuous area on each patient care unit, the clinical staffing plan for that unit, and the actual daily staffing for the unit. <clears throat> so this gives employees in the area a nice opportunity to kind of audit the staffing situation and as they see it around them and perhaps complain if something is not right. Also, the staffing plans must be posted on the Department of Health website. The committees are also responsible for reviewing the staffing plans, adjusting them as necessary and responding to any complaints that they receive of potential violations. So in reality, many hospitals might already have procedures in place that are similar to those that are about to be required by law, as I just discussed. And so this law may operate as a way to kind of formalize existing procedures and create potential con consequences for non-compliance if this is something that the, um, that the hospital has already been doing or should have already been doing. Next, turning to the nursing home bill real quick. So like I said, this one pertains specifically to nursing homes as opposed to hospitals. This proposed law is similar to the hospital bill in that it relates to safe staffing measures, but though it appears to be quite different in the way that it actually operates. So this bill authorizes the commissioner of health to establish through regulations, um, staffing standards for nursing homes. The legislation itself sets forth a specific statutory minimum standard of care that the commissioner's standard must meet or exceed through the regulations. So under the statutory standard, beginning January 1st of 2022, next year, every nursing home must maintain daily average staffing hours of equal to 3.5 hours of care per resident at a minimum. Until January 1st, 2023, at least 2.2 of those required 3.5 hours must be provided by a certified nurse's aide or just a nurse's aide that's not necessarily certified. And the remaining 1.1 hours must be provided by a licensed nurse. After January 1st of 2023, the 2.2 hours must be provided by a CNA, certified nurse's aide, um, not not by um, somebody who doesn't yet have a license, and again, the remaining 1.1 by a licensed nurse. The nursing home is also going to be required to post information regarding nurse staffing um, publicly at the facility. So lastly, the legislation authorizes the Commissioner of Health to put out regulations that will establish civil penalties for failure to comply with minimum staffing levels, and the penalties will account for, they're supposed to account for mitigating factors, including extraordinary circumstances facing the facility, such as natural, natural disasters, um, the frequency of noncompliance, and the existence of a nurse, nurse labor shortage in the area of the nursing home, if it exists. So again, this is a high-level overview. If you have any questions about the proposed legislation, please reach out to um, any bond attorney in the employment group or in the healthcare practice group. And as Adam said, we did put out a blog on this, which will have some, um, it should link specifically to the text of the legislation if you wanna take a look at that.
And that is all I have. So I will turn it back over to you, Adam. Mary, thanks so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. We appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day to be with us on Tuesday afternoon. So we will see you next week.